Hi all, I wanted to um, re-record the IP lecture since I forgot to click record during the live version of it. So now hopefully all of you will have access to the material. Okay, so this lecture was on the IP, mostly about the IP packet. And so um, here's the, a visualization of the IP uh, packet, IP header. Let me get my pointer out. Okay, and so... Um, we have the bytes of the packet organized into, or the, I guess the bits of the packet organized into 32 bits going this way. Um, and here's how those bits break down. So first we have the protocol version number, which is going to be either version four or version six. Uh, version six uh, uh, will be covered in later lectures, or I guess at this point it was covered already. Um, we also have um, header length, um, which specifies how long um, how many bytes the header takes. Um, the uncertainty comes from the fact that there are options potentially optionally included in this header. And so we want to delineate where the header ends and when the data begins. Okay, so we have header length and bytes. Um, then we have um, the type of service that is being carried. This would be um, really the priority or um, of, of the packet, this is used. Uh, this was used in diffserve or inserve. We'll we'll talk about those protocols later. But you can think of it as kind of a, a priority of um, of data. Okay. Um, this, by the way, is not really used in the internet um, anymore, but it is potentially can be used inside of um, data center networks in some cases. Um, Next, we have length of the packet, which is the total length, including including the data. Um, we need this to tell how many how much data there is after the header. Um, we also have the 16-bit identifier, uh, flags, and fragment offset, which are all used for fragmentation and reassembly. I'll cover that in a second. Um, we have time to live, which is how many hops this IP uh, packet will be forwarded uh, through before a router drops it. So this is basically there to prevent packets from filling out the internet in case there are routing loops, right? Because if there's a routing loop, that means that a packet will be forwarded in a circle among a group of routers or bounced back and forth between two routers. And we don't want packets getting stuck there forever. Um, and so to deal with that, a packet will be forwarded only some number of hops after which it will be dropped. And so um, the, 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 those routing loops will not fill up um, with data from you know years and years ago that hasn't been dropped yet. Um, next, we have um, some bits for upper layer, which basically determines the upper layer protocol to which this IP, the data from um, included in this packet uh, should be processed by. So for example, you can include TCP as the upper layer, and so whatever you pass in data uh, will be passed to TCP. Now, this data would contain the TCP header and then its own data portion, and so when you pass this data to the TCP layer, it will be able to process the header that's included in the data portion from the point of view of the IP packet. Next, we have the checksum, which includes all those fields to, to check for corruption. And then finally, we get to um, the source IP address and the destination IP address, um, which are used in routing. Um, and then you can, as I mentioned before, you can include options, if any. Those options could include things like collecting timestamps, recording route or, or interfaces uh, traversed by the packet. There are lots of other options, um, but not all of those are necessarily obeyed by the router. So they are kind of, you can specify them, but there's no guarantee that a router will uh, even read those at all. Okay, you can then ask how much overhead there is. Well, if you count all these up, basically starting from here up, you'll see that there are uh, 20 bytes of, um, of IP header. You will also discover that there are 20 bytes of TCP header, which includes 40 bytes. So if IP packet is about 1500 bytes, which is determined by ethernet, we'll get back to why that is later on. Um, but once you take a 1500 byte packet, which is basically the packet size in the internet, and then you uh, subtract those 40 bytes, you'll end up with 1460 bytes of uh, payload within a TCP segment. Okay, um, next I want to cover fragmentation, which is unique to IPv4. This doesn't exist in IPv6. And um, this is also part of your homework, I believe, and a part of your uh, programming assignment three for sure. So here's what's happening. Let's say we have this network um, with a number of links. Now, the maximum transmission unit determined by the link layer 
which is basically the largest packet that you can form on this link is 4000 bytes on this link but then it is uh, 1500 bytes on this link maybe this is sort of your local area network but then this is the router that gives you access to the internet and so from then on you need to forward packets that are 1500 bytes so let's say that for whatever reason you do transmit a um, IP packet of 4000 bytes um, and now that 4000 bytes will not fit over the next link so what happens well the IP protocol allows for these routers to split IP packets into smaller packets right and this is where um, the flags of identifier sorry the fields of identifier flags and fragment offset come into play okay so we have this um, packet whose length is 4000 bytes and you can see its identifier is X, it's just some number, we'll call it X for now. Uh, fragmentation flag is zero and offset is zero, that's basically the original packet. Now, when that packet reaches that router, that router knows, looking at the MTU of the interface, that it needs to fragment that packet into smaller IP packets. So what does it do? Well, it takes, it creates the first packet whose length is 1500 bytes. Great, okay. We set the same ID, right, because we're splitting up this packet. We can set the fragmentation flag to 1. Now we know this is a fragmented packet. And we set the offset of 0, meaning that this packet contains the bytes of this payload starting at 0. And there's how many of them? Well, 1,500 in the whole, in the whole packet. OK, so then we have the second small packet with the same length, same ID. Also, frag flag is set, but now the offset is 185. Okay, what does the offset mean? Offset is calculated as the offset number times 8. Yeah, so instead of putting a big number here, we just assume that we can multiply it by 8. And so 185 times 8 gives us 1480, which is the amount of payload that was included in this 1500 byte packet. Now, this just subtracts the IP header length, but includes the TCP header because the TCP segment is the payload or the data from the point of view of IP. So the second packet will contain, um, will, will be off size, the second packet will be off size 1500 and include 1480 bytes from byte 1480, which was the payload in the first packet. All right? And the third packet um, has a smaller length, basically up to 4000. Uh, same ID, frag flag is set to zero because this is the last uh, segmented packet and the offset is 370 to contain the rest of the payload. And so we have this big packet, it gets fragmented. Then these fragments arrive at the next router and the next router doesn't assemble them because it doesn't know what's going to happen later. It simply forwards them to the destination and now the destination um, can do the assembly of this into the full size packet before its payload is forwarded to um, IP. Why can't we just forward the different payloads separately? Well, because in case of this being a TCP segment, the header of the TCP segment pertains to all the data, and so the header is included in this TCP segment, but not the other ones, right? Here's just data that would have been included in this TCP segment. All right, so we need to reassemble the IP at the destination before forward forwarding it to TCP. Okay. Um, so next we want to talk about um, IP addressing and so um, what IP addresses look like it's basically a, four, a set of four numbers separated by dots and these numbers are uh, numerics representing the bytes of a 32-bit number so the IP address is really a 32-bit number but for convenience we split it into four bytes and then interpret each of these bytes as its own number and separate them by dots Okay, so this binary number would be interpreted as 223.1.1.1. Okay, so this is basically this IP address, and you can see that on a uh, subnet, you'll have a bunch of addresses that are similar. They basically differ by what is put into the last byte. Okay, so we have the subnet. And with IP addresses attached to interfaces, and we can... Sep, uh, describe each subnet as uh, this subnet in particular as 223.1.1.0 uh, slash 24 
and this means that these first 24 bytes of the 32 bytes of the whole IP address are set and these are free these this last these last eight bits are free to be uh, assigned to the different interfaces that comprise this subnet right? and you can see that for a router a router doesn't have a single IP address like you think of a computer having a single IP address it has in this example three IP addresses one attached to each of to each of its interfaces okay. so when you think about a subnet um, it's basically a set of devices or device interfaces specifically that share a part of an IP address okay um, and they can also reach each other without an intervening router right so even though these addresses here and these addresses here all start with 223 they're not part of the same subnet because they can interface only through a router so all the addresses that can talk to each other directly without going through a router are part of a subnet now it's a little nebulous how they talk to each other directly but later on we'll learn that the, there are basically uh, link layer switches in there that do broadcasts um, or well not just broadcasting but forwarding generally within a, a, a tree network okay so the historical question is was how to assign IP addresses to the different organizations and so in the early days of the internet um, addresses or address spaces were divided into network classes class A class B and class C and so a class A network address would specify the first eight bits of a number and then the other 24 bits would be left for the organization to assign to its clients right? so this is a very big address space because all these bits would be free um, on the other hand they could this organization could then sell multiple um, or assign multiple class B addresses where the first 16 bits would be set but these would be free to be uh, specified by um, the class B um, owner okay so a class A address with these bits specified could specify um, 256 using these bits class B addresses and then class C addresses have the first 24 bits specified now a problem arose where um, the class 24 addresses were not really big enough for many organizations um, and on the other hand many organizations didn't need a full class B or a class A address so for example if you had a, a class C address and 500 users in your organization well these 256 addresses would not be enough but an, then on the other hand having a class B address would be way too many addresses leading to wasteful, to wasteful assignments to deal with this issue, people came up with CIDR or classless interdomain routing. And what this basically means is that you can specify the IP address and then the number of bits that are fixed in it. Right? So this would be a uh, slash 24 address with these 24 bits set and these being free to be assigned. And if you wanted to double the number of um, IP addresses for you to assign, you could instead of slash 24 get a slash uh, 23 address and then be able to use all these bits um, to assign to hosts within your organization all right so um, just for the practice how many subnets are in this network um, let's see we can count them so we have some addresses here that connect without a router we have some addresses here that connect to each other without a router and share an address space and same here so we have one two three but then what happens to these well, it turns out that these also are interfaces that share an IP address and there's no router in between them. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six um, subnets in this network. Okay. The next question could be what is the routing path from A to B? And looking at this network, you can say, well, first we go to R1, then R2, and then B. Well, it turns out that in IP world, um, this goes a little bit differently because we're forwarding packet not to routers but to particular interfaces. So you could describe this routing path as 223.1.1.3, then 223.1.9.1 because that's where this router is forwarding that packet to, and then 223.1.2.1. So it's basically the two interfaces along a path. 
right? Well, now let's say that you want to get an IP address. How would you get it? Well, you could, if you're an ISP, you can get it from the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, um, where you can get a big ISP block, let's say a slash 20 with these IP addresses specified. Then if you're a client of that ISP, you can get some set of IP addresses. For example, um, organization zero might get this address space, which is 200.23.16.0 slash 23. Okay, so it's 200, which is this 8-bit um, number, 23, okay, and then 16, specifying using the whole specification of the um, um, of, of these 8 bits, right? This is 16, but slash 23, meaning that the free bits end here, or the assigned bits end here, and free bits start here. Okay? And so this ISP could assign multiple blocks like these, multiple slash 23 blocks, to the different organizations. Now, if you're a client, you maybe know that you can use a particular IP address or use DHCP, which I'll talk about in a second, to get your own IP um, out of a slash 23 address that's maybe part of your organization. Okay. You could ask a question, would it ever make sense to specify a subnet as 200.23.19.0 slash 23? The answer is no. Let's see why. So if we, here we have 18. So we have 200, that's cool. 23, that's cool. And now instead of this 18, we would have 19. What would that mean? Well, that would mean that this bit is flipped to one, but that is past the 23. So you can say that 19 slash 24 and then include this in the fixed bit uh, space. Or if you're going to say that 23, then we assume that this bit is zero. And so this number has to be even. And so you can have uh, 16, 18 or 20, but not 19 or 21. OK, so let's talk about DHCP, um, which is basically how uh, we get access to our IPs when we connect to a network. Um, you can configure this in Windows uh, going through these menus or in Unix by going to this file and specify which DHCP server um, you want to be using or what is your static configuration, your network configuration rather. Okay? Now, if you're a mobile user or if in fact you're running an organization that has a slash 24 network but has more than 256 users, you may want to assign IPs dynamically based on when users arrive on this network and leave, assuming that not all of them are going to be connected at the same time, meaning not all of them need to need an IP address at the same time, and so they can recycle the pool of addresses available at your DHCP server. Okay, so um, let's see. L let's let me show you an example of how an arriving client would um, receive a. Um, a DHCP, a, how an arriving client would receive an IP address from a DHCP server. There we go. Okay, so a client would send a DHCP discover message from source address of all zeros because it doesn't have anything yet, and it would send it on port from port 68 um, using UDP um, to destination 255, 255, 255, 255, which is basically a broadcast address, an internet-wide broadcast address. Okay, on port 2, port 67. Now, the reason this doesn't actually get broadcast to all of the internet is because the first hop router will not forward this data on. Okay, but if it did, it could. It is essentially addressed to all of the internet. Um, but the reason we do it is that the arriving client doesn't know if the DHCP server is in the slash 24 network or a slash 16 network. So it will just broadcast it to everybody, assuming that the first hop router stops this broadcast, and um, but it it does, but the DHCP router, um, DHCP server is somehow be between somewhere between the first hop router. Okay, this client says that my address is all zeros. It doesn't know what it is, and but it specifies a transaction ID, okay, just a random number. Now the DHCP server will reply with an offer, and will say, hey, my source IP address is this. Um, sending this from port 67, which is the server DHCP port, to destination, and again, it broadcasts it, right, because this client doesn't have an IP address yet, so it needs to broadcast it to all the clients on port 68. 
um, the DHCP offer include the address for this client, an offer of your address, your internet address, um, and it includes the transaction of the discover message. Okay, and this allows basically this client to look for these DHCP offers and find the one intended for it. Now, with this offer, the client can send a DHCP request specifically to, this, to the IP address of the DHCP server with a new transaction ID and a lifetime of 10 minutes, for example. Right? So this client says, okay, cool, I will take this IP address for 10 minutes, and then the DHCP server says, okay, cool, um, here's your IP address, and I'm giving it a lifetime, I'm acknowledging the lifetime for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, this DHCP server will remove the assignment of IP to this client unless the client reissues the DHCP request before the 10 minutes expires. Okay? So if a client does leave the network, the, the DHCP assignment will expire, but if it doesn't, it will continually keep refreshing its IP by resending the DHCP requests. Okay? And this basically covers uh, the missed lectures. It's, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit shorter, but I think it's to the point. Um, so if you have any questions about this, let me know. Um, again, the, the, the um, IP fragmentation is part of your uh, assignments, your programming assignments. So uh, please ask questions if any come up. All right, thank you.